Arts Visiting Artist Lecture. Tonight, um, we're welcoming Eve Fowler, who's a photographer and uh, also a multidisciplinary artist who also curates and uh, is working on a series of text posters now. She's based in Los Angeles and also has been based in New York, and she collaborates between New York and Los Angeles with someone, uh, Lucas Michael, in New York. Um, and she's coming to talk to us about her new project based on the work of Gertrude Stein and some of her photo work from the past 15 to 20 years. And I invited her because her, um, her practice spans a lot of different disciplines, but it has a very consistent theme to it. And I thought that theme would be really important for us now um, to talk about in terms of the shift between image and text and also the shift between identities. So, with that in mind, please welcome Eve Fowler. Thanks, Nancy. Um, let me know if you can't hear me. Can you hear me? All right, I see you can hear me. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna show you a couple different bodies of work, a few different bodies of work. Um, I can't show you everything, but I'm going to try to touch on a few things. Um, the first body of work that we're going to look at um, are photographs that I made um, between 2004 and about 2008 or 2009. Um, and they're mostly pictures of my friends. And um, this, is, this is sort of one of the, the pivotal pictures in, in this body of work. Um, so that they're sort of incidental pictures that I took with like a digital camera or a little snapshot camera or a smaller point and shoot camera that, was, that had film in it. Um, and then I also made photographs with a larger format camera, which if you're in the photography department, you're probably familiar with like a four by five sort of camera that's on a tripod and negatives are four by five inches. So that's what we're looking at now. Um, and this image, um, I'll just tell you the story of this image. It's a little bit of a long backstory. Um, this uh, person in the photograph is Kate Hardy. She's a, an artist, and she's a performance artist. Um, and like the year before I took this picture, about eight months before I took this picture, I was watching her do a performance um, on Governor's Island in um, an artist named Alice, Allison Smith's. Um, she, she did a, a weekend of performances on Governor's Island in New York. Um, and while I was watching her do this performance, I thought, wow, it's really interesting that this young artist in her 20s is kind of channeling Valley Export. Valley Export still makes work. She's older, but she was probably most known for this piece she made called Action Pants in the late 70s. Um, <clears throat> And that was a performance piece where she had the crotch cut out of her pants and she would go into theaters, um, like movie theaters and things, and stand in front of men. And it was sort of like a feminist act, sort of. The idea was that um, it had something to do with the male gaze and, and um, cinema. And um, that's, why it was, that's why it initially occurred in, in a movie theater. So at any rate, um, watching Kate Hardy um, make this piece really made me think for a long period of time about how my generation had sort of not necessarily thought so much about those artists, had sort of like seen it, digested it, and kind of moved on from it. And like, I feel like the generation I, I'm in makes like slightly more flippant work. It's maybe a little bit more funny um, and a little bit less directly political. So I decided to go to New York and photograph her and then sort of in, this, in the piece that she made she had these chaps on the pink leather chaps and then she had a, um, a pair of like yellow pantyhose with a huge vagina sewn on the front so she wasn't nude in the piece but um, I felt like since she was I knew she was referencing Valley Export that we should really reference that piece so that's where this piece comes from. Oops, how did that happen? OK. 
I go back to full screen, but I wish I could do it without. I guess I can't use this. Okay, we don't have to. I can see it yeah. Okay. Sorry. No, it's all right. As I said, um, it, it came out in a couple different ways. I, I haven't really photographed women that much before 2004, and um, I just started photographing who I was around, which was this very queer community um, with my friends and some girlfriends. And, um, and part of the reason I wanted to do that was because I felt like there was this sort of perception, I guess, more in the media of people that are queer that. It was really pretty negative, and, and I thought it was, so, it was so odd that that was the perception when everyone I knew was really smart and really interesting, and they were all artists and really powerful people with pretty incredible personalities. So I thought it would be interesting to make a body of work that sort of uh, made those qualities really apparent um, when the viewer would look at the photograph. And then this is an example of, you know, when I was making this, I was also using like a smaller camera. Is there a way to turn off the lights so that the image looks a little better? Sure. sure. All of them? It doesn't have to be all of them, but um, as many as possible. Yeah, that's way better. Okay. So just so you get so you get an idea of kind of well, that's a little out of focus, but um, how they should look. Um, so yeah, so there are these more incidental, loose sort of pictures, and eventually I took all those these sort of smaller format pictures and uh, made black and white prints on newsprint and stapled them together and sold them as books. Um, um, and I, I still, I think, Printed Matter in New York sells them. Um, and it's sort of like, the, the reason that I made those books initially was so that I could send them to people so people could see my work without having to like sort of go to a publisher and get a book published because I, um, one of the things that I think is really important is just sort of doing things that you want to do and just taking the power to do it rather than trying to get someone else to do it or, you know, being in a position of asking for something. I think that it, it is really powerful to be able to just do something and make something um, and I think about that in a, in a lot of different ways in my practice. So there's a lot of that going on, like a lot of sort of just figuring out what I want to do and then rather than doing it in a traditional way, trying to just figure out a way that I can do it without much money on my own. Um, so this is a very close friend of mine who, um, I met in 2006, and um, she is sort of trans-identified, but more kind of woman-identified, but she had like a one-year period where she took hormones and had top surgery and was male-identified, and then she sort of changed her mind and... Um, you know, identifies as queer as a woman, but not as a man. So, I have quite a few friends like that. Um, so, um, I photographed her for a couple of years. Um, this is her with her art collaborator, who's Wu Sang, who's also an artist. Um, and then, at some point she came to me and said, I want to be active in your photographs, I don't want to be passive. And we made a body of work together um, that involved like sculpture performance and photography. And we showed it at the Yerba Buena. And we've shown it in a couple different places. I can't show it to you because it's too explicit. But, um, but at any rate, it's on the internet. <laughs> um, so that was kind of 
I, I feel like the first image I showed you was the start of the kind of collaborating because um, the day before that image was taken, there were other images taken and Kate sort of looked at the pictures with me and we decided that it needed to be changed in several different ways. So I felt like that was the kind of collaboration and I felt like the, when I started making pictures that felt more collaborative with the person in, in the picture, that the picture started to get better. And that the more active the person in the picture was, the better. And I, I also really had a hard time, you know, it's, while I was doing this, I was also teaching. And, you know, a lot of my students were taking pictures of people, and I would talk a lot about how difficult it is to represent a subject responsibly, and, you know, it's really difficult if the person is very other from you, like if they're um, in a different financial, financial situation or a different race or whatever, if they're not really connected to you, I think it, get, it gets really tricky and it still gets tricky even if they are really connected to you um, because you know you, you don't want to, especially as a photographer, you don't want to exploit people. You don't want to represent them in a way that is not positive. I guess. Um, This photograph is somewhat important to me just because um, I, I guess in, I don't really know what year it was, it must have been like 2008. No, it was earlier than that. In 2004 I was in a show at the One Institute, which is a gay and lesbian ar archive that's um, housed by USC in Los Angeles. And um, they have a huge library an incredible archive, but they also have books for sale. And I ended up amassing this small library, and, and I felt like this was really separate from my work. Like, but I would read these books, and I was constantly talking to all my friends about, about these books. And this is one of them, and it's kind of a, a pulp novel that, in a way, isn't very good, but it's about these sort of lesbians in the, in the West Village, which in this book they were calling Greenwich Village, because it was the 50s. And it was really interesting just in terms of history and how, how hard people um, had it and they were all sort of like drinking a lot and just sort of behaving in ways that were maybe not the healthiest. Um, but at any rate, I, I'll, eventually I'll show you some other project that involves this sort of little library of books because that I ended up taking this thing that I was very interested in and turning it into an art project. But then here it's just showing up because my girlfriend reading at my house um, at the time. So these are, these pictures are kind of more incidental and diaristic when they look a little bit looser, you know, they're sort of just like in the car or just because I have a small camera and, um, you know, you can't use a 4x5 view camera on a roof, so. <laughs> and this I think is 4x5. But. So I, I don't know if I'm going to have time to show you, there's another body of work that I made in the 90s where it's sort of like in, within the body of work there's sort of these types, so these are archetypal types or, um, and I feel like that sort of occurs here too in these sort of types. And then this references a Walker M Evans image. Um, I don't know if you guys know who Walker Evans is, but Walker Evans was a Farm Security Administration photographer and he photographed people in Appalachia and he worked with James Agee, who's a writer, and, um, and there's an image that looks sort of physically similar to this of a woman and that woman is someone that both the photographer and the writer in, this, in that project had an affair with. And, um, <laughs> I just was, was thinking about that sort of um, boundary crossing or something in, like, within a project. I mean, that's one of the, the most sort of like, I found, I always found that information really interesting because it's, it's a really famous body of work and that, that photograph is very well known and then I don't think that many people know that, um, like sort of how involved or intimate the photographer and the writer were with the family. Um, and then this is 
when I would make these books, there were a lot of images like this that were just sort of like, this is in the window of a store in New York. And, um, sometimes they are just images of women represented in various ways, like maybe not how I would represent them, but um, I'm interested in that kind of, all kinds of representation. This um, image is one of my really close friend's sister-in-law um, on the day of her wedding. And this wedding was, I, I feel like this picture is kind of loaded because it was um, when, I mean, I think the issue of gay marriage is very controversial now, but it, it felt like it was a slightly more controversial then because it's been legal and then not legal, but before that, when this was taken, it wasn't, hadn't been legal yet. And half the people at the wedding were gay, and they were, there were a lot of people that were mad that these friends were getting married. Um, and this is the groom's sister. And I, I was taking wedding photographs for them as a gift, and I had 10 pieces of film. This four by five film is, it's really expensive. So I took nine boring photographs of the family and the bride. <laughs> And I had one piece of film left, and I was like, oh, I just want to make one picture that I want to make. So I photographed Sam um, Miller, and I thought it was pretty amazing because she was, she's so, I feel like this picture represents her as really powerful and really self-possessed, and you can see that she's smart. Um, but I also feel like it's really symbolic and meaningful that it was at this wedding that is something that she's, she's sort of representing all these people that can't participate in this kind of thing, you know, in a sense, and really adamantly, rep you know, representing that um, image. So, um, and then, so the person that I'm talking about who is her sister-in-law, Anna Suhoi, is a sculptor. Um, we've made a lot of collaborative work, um, and this is a piece that kind of com combines her practice and my practice and she went to graduate school and lived with the first person that we looked at with the pants cut out, who's Kate Hardy. And I feel like um, Kate's a pretty hardcore feminist and I feel like Anna having spent a couple summers with Kate at Bard, it really influenced this picture in a sense because she kind of made this gesture when she was, she was making something and I was photographing it. Um, so, but we were sort of thinking the same. I mean, I think I was thinking about the cover of a book that I have, which is called Sisterhood is Powerful, which is this collection of like feminist essays from the 70s. And it has a fist on it. And I think a lot of like sort of um, oppressed groups have used this fist as a symbol. Um, so, um, and then this is just an image from a show that we did where we made photograms. We combined our, um, things that we'd used in previous works and just uh, made these six, uh, 16 by 20 photograms and um, there's a little bit more abstract. Um, and then we made these sort of, uh, you know, when we work together we make these sort of more fun, silly things. So this combines something that I picked up at the store on the way, which was an old hot dog and, <laughs> and you know, this is in her studio, this is a piece she made, the metal thing, and then she had a small fog machine for something. So, um, okay. Um, all right, it seems like we're, we're jumping around a little bit, but I think that's okay. Um, there's, a, there's a little bit of a gap here because there's that body of work that was kind of the impetus for this work, but I'm not showing it to you. Um, in about 2008, I was preparing for a class that I was teaching in um, San Francisco called I'm Not, Not Really a Photographer, and I was reading um, about Sigmar Polka's work. Um, and he made this really beautiful body of work that was really black. Um, but the content was, uh, was really interesting to me because he, he was out, in, he was in Brazil, in America, he was with a bunch of 
curators and there's a rainstorm and he they all sort of got like blown into this bar and they didn't know where they were and then they realized they were in a gay bar and so he took these photographs and then he printed them. He sort of prints like using the fixer first sometimes so the prints kind of look damaged or like you can't see everything. But in terms of his work, I thought that was like some of the darkest work he'd ever made and I thought, oh, that's really interesting that you're a white straight guy like erasing this population that is always kind of being erased, or is fighting not to be erased, or is like really struggling to be visible. Um, so in part, this is about that, which sort of seems antithetical to that idea, but, um, but also I, a previous body of work that I made ended up on a Japanese porn site, and there was really nothing that me and my friend who made it could do about that. So. I thought, oh, it'd be really interesting to just describe the work in the titles and then print the photographs till they're black. So I made negatives, I made four or five negatives of, you know, just um, like the, the one is like two people in bed together or a woman, you know, seated in a chair or a woman standing in a hallway with, with no clothes on or whatever. Um, so you have to imagine what's in the photographs, you can't see it because I couldn't sort of control where the photographs went once they were like on the internet. Okay, so this, this is um, a still, these are both stills from, um, this is from the California Biennial in 2010 and then this is from, my friend does a, a gallery in her apartment called Apartment 2 in New York, um, Catherine Andrews. Um, and this is a piece that I made, um, and it's the library that I talked about from the One Institute. So there, there are um, about 63 books, and they're wrapped because the first 20 um, were in my apartment wrapped in collages that I would made as a gift for someone. And then my friend who curates, who's curating a show in New York, asked me not to give it away as a gift so she could put it in a show and a gallery in New York. So I ended up um, making the project bigger and not giving it away as a gift, but then it just sort of organically happened that these things were wrapped. So the way that this, this piece works is that um, the title is kind of the piece in a way, because the title includes um, the author's name, the publisher, the year, and some information about the book. In some cases, there's like a short story in the title. So the title's six pages long. I should actually have the title, I'm sorry in this slice that shows so you could sort of look at it. But um, I thought that was important because, um, you know, I've looked through a lot of these books and some of them are really well written and amazing and some of them aren't, but they're all like, you know, women writers in the 70s and 80s who were really out and writing with these books when it was really hard to do that. Um, and I thought it would be great for them to be acknowledged. So when I was in the California Biennial, I made sure that the catalog included all of that information. So like everybody who bought the catalog has that information. Um, there's the piece in the Biennial. And then I don't have a picture of this, of course, but on the wall, there's like the three pages that are the title, they sort of like condensed it and they type smaller, but the piece included the title, and that's really important. Um, so, um, so we're skipping ahead to last year. <laughs> um, I'm going to sort of show you this, and then we're going to go back a little bit, so I can show you like how this came about. Um, I guess maybe three years ago, I was. Um, I was watching somebody that I know make a video. They're just working for like six hours. And while I was watching that, I was reading Tender Buttons by Gertrude Stein. I read it a few times. It's very short. And I was taking notes. And I wasn't taking notes to make art out of it. I was just taking notes. I was just sort of like noticing certain sentences and phrases that I thought were really amazing. It was written in like 1914. Um, and 
I, I feel like um, I felt like a lot of the language is really incredible. It was really queer, but really coded, and you would only know that. You know, it, I mean, I think that one of the great things about that book is that like you could perceive it sort of however you want it, wanted to. So it's very open to interpretation. Um, but. Um, Um, so I, in the beginning, I took this text and I was making. Um, um, I'm trying to find it. I was making these sort of um, collages that were just cut out from magazines. So I probably made, you know, like a hundred or so of these with this text. And then, what's this worst thing I want to do? Um, and then I had a studio downtown, and I was just kind of collecting cardboard and wood and um, various things, and using spray paint and um, newsprint and just whatever was around, and like pins and nails. And um, actually, the piece that says "All Days" is just a text message. That's the only one that's not um, from Bridgestone. But um, and then at some point for a show in New York called Greater LA. I, took this piece of cardboard, had it scanned, and then printed it about the size that you see it projected. Um, so it, that sort of then became this very finished object that looks like a photograph or a sculpture because it, it's mounted and it leans on a wall. Um, so um, I was basically just sort of working with things that I had, like I, I had magazines, I had newsprint, fine cardboard, and then like in this case, like this is eventually like scanned and printed as a photograph. Um, and then I was driving downtown all the time to my studio and I would see these posters. This is one of my posters, but this is a really inexpensive form of advertisement and it's really prevalent in LA, um, especially in poor neighborhoods. Like, this is that's usually where you see these posters. So um, it you know it advertises like concerts or events of some kind, and um, they're really really garish in here. But I thought it would be really interesting to to um, make a public art project out of this, so that people that maybe don't go to museums or don't go to galleries would get to like sort of hang around and wait for the bus and experience this language and, and just kind of wonder about it. Um, and ultimately not really knowing what it is or where it came from, but um, I find the language really pleasurable, so, and I really enjoy, you know, sort of its ambiguity and things like that, so um, I raised money through the United States um, Artists Grant, and I, you know, I got like a $6,000 grant, and I um, had all these posters made, and posted them around Los Angeles, and then, um, it's an earlier one. You can kind of see in my studio how it, how it evolved. And there's that larger, a side of Moore's photograph of a, of a collage that's framed. And this is um, really blurry, but it's, um, each letter is cut out of the end of a chapter of a book. I thought that was, I mean, you could read this two different ways. Like, loves to be left or that a person loves to be left. Um, because the, sen the sentence is, she loves to be left in the book, but I cut that off because I, <laughs> I like that it could mean two things. Um, these are just like sort of studio pictures of things um, like in progress.
So these were eventually used for um, various protests and things. Um, this, in this case, this is Night Gallery, it's a gallery in Los Angeles, and um, an artist-run gallery, and this is um, one of the signs they, this was, was for a show, but it's kind of permanent, so they wanted to um, make a piece that would, would be permanent. Um, and the person that runs this gallery really likes this piece because the gallery's only open at night, and she's, you know, the, the idea that um, the piece is about evening. Um, and again, there's like kind of a double meaning. Um, and then, so this is where, where it started. And, so. and I think, I mean, one of the things about the sort of cardboard things is that, you know, I was doing that without really, I didn't really need resources to do that. I could just, you know, buy a can of spray paint or whatever and have some cardboard and work that idea out. And then eventually it got, you know, got sort of to a better place. Um, this is my friend's mom protesting in front of Lassen's, which is a health food store in Los Angeles that gave $30,000 to Prop 8. Um, so the store is kind of anti-gay marriage. So, um, so that's one of the places that people would come to me and ask me if they could borrow my signs to protest, which I really liked. But at the time, I kind of didn't have time to go protest myself. <laughs> the signs were kind of standing in for me. Um, and then this is in front of MOCA. There was a protest because of a, a Marina Abramovich. Um, There's a fundraiser in which she had people um, lying on tables naked with food on them. Um, she wasn't paying them very much, and people thought it was exploitive. So again, um, a friend asked if she could borrow some posters, so they used some of the posters um, to protest um, that. And then this is at Occupy LA, on the steps of City Hall. People were using them. Um, and I, I really like that. I mean. It, People kept calling me and asking me if I was going to go down there and protest, and I, if I was always doing something else, and I was like always basically trying to make them <laughs> So um, I just could never, could never do it, unfortunately, but I was glad that, that my posters were used for that. Um, this is um, a show in Austin, Texas, at Laura Reynolds Gallery, and what you're looking at are paintings that are like, 50 by 68, I think. Um, they're kind of twice the size of the coasters. So they're, they're paintings that I had fabricated of the science. Um, I really wanted to do, and then there's one cardboard piece on that part of the wall that says all day, all day, but I really wanted to do um, wall pieces. I wanted to make really large um, posters on the wall of the gallery. Didn't want me to do that because they wanted to try to sell them, but I was like, you can sell the plans and have somebody go over there and pay them on the first wall. And, um, but at any rate, I said, okay, well, if you pay for the fabrication, then I'll make paintings. And I ended up, you know, I like them. Um, it's sort of a different. And then I recently did a project where I took some of the images that I showed you of um, of the the posters installed in public, like on, on telephone poles and stuff, and I printed them out on newsprint and put them in a vitrine in a show, and then had the posters hanging on the wall. So it's like a public art project, project in a vitrine. Mm. And then this is a studio that I had in Pasadena, and I um, made work there, but I also had a lot of other artists come in and make work with me, and Sam Gordon made the, the piece that's on the railing that's a dyed piece of fabric with um, decals on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I really like to a lot. This is just a close-up of the poster. Okay. Um, um, I want to talk to you about artist creative projects, which is the project that I do, but I also, I might skip ahead and come back to this. This is like work from the 90s of guys that are hustlers. Um, 
I might have time to do both these things. I'll try. Okay, so this, I graduated from Yale in 1992, and then I moved to New York, and I, um, in the summer of 1993, I was actually in Los Angeles, and I started photographing guys on the street in LA that were hustlers. Um, and then, and then I started this same project in, uh, in New York. Um, and, you know, this is part of the reason, in, in part, like it took me a long time to evolve and, you know, um, that whole sort of idea of exploitation is really difficult. Like I, I feel, I had some sort of many different ideas about, about this project and um, had this idea that like I would make these pictures that were sort of like school portraits so it sort of um, would take, like, take the viewer into this place. But it, when I showed these, that I didn't say what the group of people did that linked them together, I just showed the pictures. And, um, but I wanted the viewer to look at the pictures and get this kind of like tinge of Nostalgia, because you know, in the seventies, you get these school portraits that were looked like this. They were little wall size pictures, and it's really that kind of image is really poignant for people of a certain age because they, you know, you can't not have this kind of nostalgic feeling when you look at this kind of picture. And I, and I thought that that would be interesting to sort of deal with that idea of kind of nostalgia because, and also the school portrait, because the school portrait is the thing that your parents keep. And they like put on their refrigerator, they put over the mantle, or they put on a piano, or they put somewhere in their wallet. It's just something that's kind of like, shows that you have stability and that you have people who care about you. And in this case, with this group of people, that may not be the case, you know? Um, so, um, it also creates a kind of typology or like a cataloging of a type, I guess. Um, sort of putting people in the same format. And so I showed this, you know, a lot in New York and the Museum of Modern Art in San Francisco, owns some of it. And, um, at a certain point, they're like, I, I was kind of like, huh, I don't know if this really functions the way that I want it to, because it, it does sort of elicit, like, this thing that people think, like, is kind of funny when it's not meant to be funny, or, um, and it's, you know, um, it's hard, again, like I said, it's hard to look at people that are really other than you and not feel like, and not exploit them, you know, um, when I started doing it, I wasn't, I didn't have a gallery, I wasn't selling anything. I never thought that I would sell or show them for some reason, you know, I was like, oh, that just seems impossible. But then I started showing them to people and it was a little easier than I thought. So, um, about, I don't know, a few years ago, six years, I found this box of photographs that I'd made on the street. They were still made with a four by five, but um, they were photographs where I let the guys in the picture kind of do what they wanted to do, instead of just like looking straight ahead at the camera and taking sort of everything out of the picture except the face. And I realized that these pictures that I had thought were the bad pictures were actually the good pictures. And I think part of the reason they were the good pictures is because there's a little bit more of a collaboration going on. Or like, you know, like I would have never told this person to do this, but he wanted to do it. And it really represents like who he was and how he was operating and how he was surviving, you know? Um, so it makes a lot of sense. But like, I, I took the pictures because, partially because when I was in school, the teachers there were always sort of like, you know, you should really, if you go to do something, if, you're, if you go to like, you're, you're doing a project, you should always do, something that you think you're not going to do. And just see what happens because it could lead you somewhere else. And you know, I just, these things sat in the box for like 15 years and then I made, um, again, I made these black and white prints on newsprint at Kinko's. And they're like eight by 10 and I stapled them together and then I started selling them at Print and Matter for like 20 bucks. So there's like 30 really nice 
little photographs. Um, and, you know, they're very, also they're all taken in the early 90s, so you could really see the difference kind of in style. These are all taken outside of a bar called Julius's, which is the oldest gay bar in New York. It used to be a it used to be a Yale bar where the before it was a gay bar, and then um, it's, I think it's gone now. It closed this year. Okay, so this is a photograph of a gallery called Compact Space in Los Angeles. Um, in around 2004, I was teaching, I don't even know that, I was teaching at Art Center uh, College of Design, and I had all these photography students, and they were, at a certain point in the year, they would, the, the faculty there would put up their work, and they would, the faculty would take it, frame it, tell them what size to make it, and put it in this little part of the gallery that, that was des like designated for photo. And so, at a certain point, I figured out that the students weren't able to make any of their own decisions. There was no space for them to show anything, like the art students, they were really separated in a sense. So I decided to do a class where each student paid like $30 and we rented the space in Pico Union. Um, it was about $700. So maybe there were like 11 or 15 students, I don't know. But um, so the students learned how to Basically, they learned how to set up the gallery, how to paint it, how to make a mailing list, how to make cards, how to make little publications, um, and then how to hang a show, how to make decisions about framing. So each of the students got um, an internship in a museum or a gallery that I sort of helped them set up so they could kind of, and then we also looked at every show that like we went to museums, went to galleries, we looked at how things were framed, how things were presented. Um, and that gallery ran for like six years. The students, a couple of students kept it running and I ended up leaving Art Center and teaching classes in the gallery. So like private students would come to me and they'd pay like a certain fixed amount for like eight classes. And, and those classes were great and then there'd be a show at the end of the classes and all those kids went on to go to graduate school. And um, that was a really fun experience. But um, that's, not a, that's, that's the outside of the gallery. Um, at a certain point, though, I realized, you know, I was really adamant about telling the students they should take things into their own hands and they should, you know, if they wanted to be in a show, they should just curate a show. They didn't have to wait for someone to ask them to do something. They could just make it happen themselves and they could do it through this gallery. And they were, I did very little for those students. I, I just made them do everything so that they would learn how to do things, and it was really kind of incredible. But the main, my main point with that gallery was that, um, to, to basically to empower students so that they didn't feel like defeated, like they couldn't, they couldn't get into anything, or they couldn't get into a show, they couldn't, they just didn't have the power, they didn't know the right person, and I was sort of like, you know, you are actually the right person, like you could figure out how to do this. Um, and then I started taking my own advice, and, Curating things, and this is a show at Lace that I curated with Al Steiner and um, Emily Royston called Shared Women. Um, and it was during the WAC show at MoCo, which is like a huge survey show of uh, feminist art. Um, and it was this was sort of like younger generation, and also more nepotistic. Like we asked our friends, and we were very open about that in the press release. You know, we were interested in you know, working with our friends and people that we knew, and people that influenced us. And, and then after that, I started a project called Artist Creative Projects um, in my apartment with Lucas Michael. And we, and this is one of the openings, we asked our friends who were artists to curate shows. And um, in this case, this is the second show, I think this is Alex Sagade, who is in My Barbarian. He's in a collective, so he was one of the few like, solo shows in the beginning. And generally, it was just, um, you know, 
uh, one artist would pick three or four friends and show their work. Um, but again, we did this with very little money. I sold some furniture to get it out of the way, and then we'd spend like maybe $80 a show, so $40 a piece on beer and paint. So we really kept it to a minimum. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. So, yeah, I, there are many more pictures so we've done shows since we've showed like maybe 150 artists and been doing shows since uh, 2008, since August 2008. Still we have a show opening on Saturday and a show opening the next Saturday in another location and, and it's really fun to be able to, um, for me to be able to work with my friends. Nancy was in one of the shows actually. And, right behind Yeah. <laughs> um, which was great at Eric Kim's house and did a really amazing performance. Um, and, okay, well it's 8.22. So do you guys have any questions? Just should I do that? Yeah, we can do questions. Why don't we put the house lights on, or the just the back lights on, and then. Um because I wanted to slow down because I'd used a 35 millimeter for a long time and I felt like I stopped thinking. But then um, I wanted to use a smaller format camera to become a little bit looser. And one of the things that I realized like, with a small camera is like if the, if the content of the picture isn't really good, the picture is just not good. You know, you can't depend on like things being sharp and the light being really nice just like the content, so it made me focus like on the quality of the content in a way that I was really interested in. And also it was so loose, it was so different from, I think that my personalities were like fairly loose, but like um, that's why the photography was like really, had to be really like uptight, because it was like, um, I wanted it to be sharp and you know, really sharp and really good so I can make it really big and then really perfectly framed. And and then when I, when I showed that work, I showed it next to the smaller format work, just like pinned on the wall. So like they worked in concert with each other pretty well, I thought, you know. Um, and I'm glad I did both things. Um, at what size did you present your pictures when they were hanging in the gallery? Well, the the large format ones were 30 by 40, um, and then the smaller format ones were just 11 by 14. Yeah. So, um, there's 20 different posters, and there's a hundred of each poster. But um, I didn't put all of those up. I put a lot of them up, but I also like I sold some of them to a collection in. Um, San Diego, I can't, it's in the library or something. And then, actually they were donated. Somebody bought them and sold. So like I'll sell them for usually $100 a piece, and, or I'll sell a set for like much less than like 20. Um, and then I did that in the middle and then I started making more. So like first there were 16 that I made the other four. Um, and I've shown them in a lot of different kinds of places. Like I showed them in the Venice Beach Biennial, which is really fun because we were out on the beach for three days. Like, with all the other people that make stuff out on the beach. There were like 20 artists that were like hammer artists from the Made in LA show and then 20 artists that were always down there. And it was a really fun mix because they worked really well together and there was a similarity to it. Um, but so, the, and then I, I did it, I had them out in the desert to Wendy Yao who runs with the Buga, um, did a project with Andrea Zatel who's out in the desert, who does high desert test sites at this swap meet. And so there were a bunch of artists that were um, 
showing work and kind of selling work. And I've worked with those posters in a lot of different um, art contexts, and I and I give them to auctions as well. So, um, like for example, lace, you know, um, which is where my friends and I curated that show, sold them at auctions. They had an option of artists that they worked with, so they were able to sell them and make like fifteen hundred dollars. So. Um, so I put them up, and then you know people steal them, which is fine. Um, and then also people buy them, and and I really love that you know people will buy them and frame them because then they stay in in people's view, like people can see them. Um, when they're up, they're plastic, you know, they stay up a long time if you put them up with a ladder. But um, you know people rip them down pretty fast. The city rips them down, um, so there's like kind of the short life. They live in the photographs of. Of the installation, sort of, but I'm still doing it. I did it like last week um, when I was going to Night Gallery, and they make, which is in Lincoln Heights, and they make um, a newspaper called Night Papers, and they put the poster that says "Anyone telling anything is telling that thing" on the cover of Night Papers. So I've been posting that around so that people will see it on their way to the gallery, and then they'll see it in the in the little magazine. I mean, it's just like saying that well, it's all Gertrude Stein. It's all tender oh. buttons. And the reason that I did that, I, which I didn't mention also, is that I was watching a, a film called Paris Was a Woman, and whoever made that documentary was talking about um, Gertrude Stein and how frustrated she felt that she didn't really get the recognition that she thought she deserved, and she didn't really publish that much while she was alive. And she got bad reviews for Tender Buttons, which is so ahead of its time and so like so crazy. To read. It's so good, um, but people just didn't really understand it. And I, I, it's really similar to this art project, ACP, Artist Creative Projects, because my friend and I started that project because we knew people who had been working for 20 years and had never had a show. And we were like, this is so crazy. How come like artists don't have any power? Like all these other people have all the power, and there are all these really interesting people that never get to have a show and then we were just on a walk one day on a hike and I was just like we should rent a space and start showing our friends work so that we have power so that we have the power to say this is who we think are really good and when artists say they think somebody's really good it means a lot you know it really means a lot because that's it means a lot to the person like people did so well after they did these shows they would um, you know have being group shows have solo shows just it, just because of the support, you know, sort of like getting a grant or something like that support feels really good. But just to go back to Gertrude Stein, I think that idea was really galling to me, like that she didn't get, because I, I just like enjoyed that writing so much that she didn't get um, the kind of exposure she deserved. I was just like, well, I'm just going to plaster this all over the place. And so many people have come to me and said, oh my god, I, I bought Tender Buttons, it's so good. Because most people know of it, and no one ever reads it, because it's like completely tangential writing. It's, there's no narrative. So it's like, but it's great, because you can pick it up. Like if you have ADD, it's really good. You can just pick it up in the middle and start reading it. And you know, it doesn't matter where you are in the book. Um, and the language is really, really beautiful and really fun. And so yeah, so it's not my, they're not, unfortunately, that is not my language, <laughs> I wish it was. It's just something that I'm trying, sort of supporting, more or less, you know, or wanting to share with people, I guess. So you did a, um, you did a Kickstarter? It's not a, it wasn't actually Kickstarter, but it functions similarly. They take more money from you than Kickstarter. It's, you have to be asked, it's a United States Artists Grant. They give away these huge grants, and I, I was actually nominated for one, but didn't get it. It's like, there was like a $50,000 grant. But um, my friend who got the grant um, was able to ask five people to do this other project where you submit an idea for a project and they tell you if they think that they can help you get the money. And basically you just ask your friends for the money. It was re really amazing that somebody gave me that I didn't know gave me $1,000, but all these people that didn't have any money that I know gave me like $25. And I know like it was really hard for them to do that because they're artists and they're like, running out of money all the time when they don't have savings. And so, I mean, that was also really meant a lot to me because people were just really um, supportive of this project. And then a lot of people that weren't able to support the project ended up later like buying a poster or whatever. So it's, it's, 
it's a good project in that way because it's like also something that um, it's like a piece of art that your friends can get because you know when I'm making this those 30 by 40 pictures they sell for four thousand dollars it's like no one that I'm friends with could ever buy that you know so um, that was another aspect of that like and then I'd sell them for 50 bucks or whatever to friends and it was a cool way for people to you know have your work whatever wasn't because, and I would credit Yale with that, honestly. I mean, because I went, I went back there for my friend's kid's graduation, and I went through, one of my friends was teaching there in the photo department, and I went through the show, and I was like, I can't believe people are still doing this. It's like, you've got to tell people they can't do this. But that, that school is kind of, you know, it's really problematic, and it, especially, like, you know, they weren't addressing those issues. I mean, and I... We weren't reading critical theory because that that um, program is really modernist, and um, there was all that sort of deconstructed theory in the '80s, written in October magazine, um, that was kind of like postmodern theory that was mentioning people that were teaching in my program as problematic, you know, and mentioning that that kind of photography. But, that program was just ignoring all that criticism. And I would have actually really liked to, to know that. So it took me a really long time. I ended up reading all of that stuff after I went to school, after I made this body of work. Um, the, the problem is like I still like the photographs, you know, I didn't I didn't have a relationship with them before I did the photographs, but I was around a lot and there's certain people that I became really good friends with. But and that, you know, some way I kind of identified with, you know, but, but I wasn't a really, I didn't have a lot of money, but I did have, you know, um, sort of, you know, I had the advantage of having an education and I had this sort of, um, another kind of capital, you know, sort of like just knowing, um, certain things that, and I could use those things to my advantage, so, but at the same time, I still like, the, the more environmental photographs I really like. The, the ones I like in the background, I'm a little less interested in, but um, there's something about having those photographs, I'm actually so glad I made them, but I understand that they can be problematic, you know, and I'm interested in that conversation, you yeah. know. Would you, like, feel uncomfortable showing you know, really, I haven't really shown the second part of that, that I've, um, but I wanted to, I'm working on a project with the One Institute, which is the Gay and Lesbian Archive that I keep mentioning. Um, I'm helping them raise money so that they can buy um, art. Um, because they have a lot of art that people have given them, and it's, it's really great, but it's like completely unknown people, and it's kind of kitschy and campy. And I just kind of wanted to basically get my friends in there that, that are really great artists that, and sort of historicize them, but I was going to use some of those photographs, like I was going to have them printed and sell them and use the money to buy other people's work for their collection. So that was what I had planned for that work, but um, yeah, no, I don't know. Yeah, it's, tr it's really tricky. That's why people don't really make photographs anymore. They use photography. They don't really go out and like just make photographs of the world so much. Not in an art context. You know, in another context they do it. People don't pay as much attention to that. I think. Do you actually enjoy the you? Yeah. It does seem like I do. Yeah. He said, do you actually enjoy what you do? <laughs> yeah. That seems good. I
No, I, no, I like it. No, it's, well, do you actually enjoy what you do? Yeah. Um, I do. I really liked it actually. Yeah, I did. Yeah, you take a lot of pictures. Well, I don't anymore as much, but I did. Oh, well, yeah, no, I just. I think it's cool. It's did you whole, say you take a lot of pictures? No, you have to take a lot of pictures. You take a lot of pictures. I know, I think it's cool. Oh, Sorry, I, I, it's hard to take pictures, but thank you. Okay, I'll see that. Yeah. Because you're so like, involved in the game, I was wondering if you've heard of, or maybe even like met Andrea Gibson. Is it a singer or something? She's a she's a slam poet. Oh really? really? Yeah. I don't know that world. Yeah. You should you should look it up. You would love slam poetry. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm a creative writer. Okay. So yeah. But anyway. Okay. It was really nice to meet you, and I loved okay. your presentation. You would take awesome pictures. Oh thanks. Thanks for coming. Um. um Hi, I'm Charlie. Nice to meet you. I was just wondering about like what you were saying about the art context and how people don't really take photographs anymore. I don't. I guess I don't know exactly what you mean. Well, I mean, a lot of people like use photography. Like a lot of people are making like these abstract images with photography, like mirrors and like you know. Um, uh, There are people that do that, but they're really off the radar. You know, they're not like, sort of seen in our context. Yeah. Can you think of anybody that I'm trying to think? Um, are you doing photography? Yeah, I'm taking it. Because there's some pretty interesting people that like are working. There's this woman. There's this woman that works. They use photography, but don't necessarily like, not in the traditional sense. Like, like there's this woman that shows at Casey Kaplan in New York. Um, I cannot remember her name. But if you looked on Casey Kaplan's website, she makes, she she uses appropriate photographs and then she'll put like a rock on top of them or a mirror. I know they're kind of interesting. You might, I can send a list to Nancy for you. Other people like, um, somebody who uses photography. Like Miguel Cabrera, like, um, the, there's a woman that shows there that's like really known for abstract photographs that like have mirrors in them and they're, you know what I'm talking about? Um, or like Waleed Vashti. Yeah, Waleed is the person I'm thinking of when you talk about that kind of stuff. There's but. a lot of people like, there's a woman that made photographs just like Waleed's though and, the, and she's been making them for a really long time. He yeah. totally stole her thing. I bet he did. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but well, I'm trying to think of other people when you say use photography but they don't use it representationally like yeah. in, the, in the sense of, um, you know, like, interestingly enough, um, sorry, my brain just went away. Um, uh, teaches at UC Riverside. Oh, on the mirror? No, no, although he's good too. And Farah is good too. Oh, she teaches that? No, no, Farah is good in terms of, you know, kind of using photography, yeah. but not representationally. Well, I could send a list, and then, well, we could brainstorm a list and give it to you. Totally. And then there's also, um, uh, um, John Devola. Some yeah. of his, some of his work, especially his later work, like, you know, in, in the interiors and architectural spaces, in his images of text, like he's actually photographing books. Oh, really? I didn't know yeah, that. and they're beautiful. I mean, they're, he had a show at LAX, not too long ago, last year, it was just, wow, it was gorgeous. And it was, you know, a lot of photographs of books and text, and this kind of like relationship between the book, the printed page, and the printed image, and this kind of nostalgia for both. Um, what else? Other photographers. Anyway, yeah, we could talk. Yeah. You can, we'll brainstorm, we'll go have a beer, and we'll talk about it, and we'll have better ideas. I'll send a list to you too, that is what. I like yeah. to, have to look around. Yeah, yeah trolling around is always good. Well, there's this show at M and B Fine Art, which is usually really traditional, but yeah, that it's um, there's some good non photography photography. Mm -hmm. Daphne Fitzpatrick's in it. Kate Hardy's in it. Oh, nice. Um, Mariah Robertson's in it. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. It's cool. Mariah Robertson makes like it's very abstract. I'm really sorry.
the other Somebody person. else? <laughs> um, and anyway, yeah, we'll send you an cool. email. I really enjoyed your presentation. Oh, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks for asking the question. So, I use the merit. I teach the photography here. Loved your portraits. What do you want to talk about? Kathy. Kathy. You still shoot, you still shoot four by five? Kathy. Kathy is the advancement. I had a meeting with her. Okay. On, um, I had a meeting with her on uh, spraying the paper a little bit. Uh, Monday, Tuesday. It's been such a crazy week. I'm sorry. Oh yeah, I know. Crazy week and trash. And uh, <laughs> but um, but then um, yeah, I think we can so yeah. we were talking about what we could do. Um, Getting around the building. No, it's not really moving around. Yeah, there's no way to get around it. And then it costs so much. Oh, it's so nice. And then